Welcome to the Startup Grind. I was born here. Uh, grew up in. Uh, I was born in Tel Aviv. Grew up in Tel Aviv in Atzalia. Um, Sofim, uh, <laughs> army, Shmona Matayim. Chaman Talpiot, right? Chaman Talpiot. I was uh, a head of a, of a unit within Shmona Matayim. At, uh, at some point, uh, officer, finished officer's course with honors. Uh, then took, uh, it's a five-year course, a five-year service. Uh, so within that period, I took a two and a half year vacation uh, from the army. Um, leave of absence basically, then did my uh, first and second uh, degree in mathematics at the Tel Aviv University, came back for the, uh, for the one year. Um, and then another one, right? What's that? And then another one, the master? The ma no, the second, the master was within that uh, two and a half years. I did the masters in uh, between mathematics and immun immunology. Uh, there was a, is there very, is a program. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. It's not conventional, uh, I think. <laughs> It's, uh, there's an interdisciplinary program uh, at Tel Aviv, a uh, Deal Outman program. I was actually the first graduate of that, uh, wow. of that program back, uh, back then, then came back uh, to the one year, finished the service, and then started my, that was 92, and then started my, uh, my first uh, company. Uh, it was not called back then startups, it was basically <laughs> called company, and there was this strange concept of building companies based on revenues, uh, <laughs> which is what, uh, what we did. Uh, it was called Shonut, it was 92. Uh, Shonut then created... Was it obvious to you that you were going to take this route, being an entrepreneur? It's, I mean, uh, it was not even called entrepreneur, it was called uh, you start your own business. Uh, it's, uh, when I left the army, I, I didn't know if I'd go and finish the PhD that I was in the middle of uh, and fly, out, uh, fly to, uh, to the US to, uh, to go uh, and finish the PhD or, or start a company. And then? Um, and then we got the project. And then, I mean, me and my, uh, my co-founder that we later started together three companies, uh, we wow. got basically a project that came to us in some way and that kind of got, was, we didn't plan too much, it was just... Uh, so you got the customer before you got, you be decided actually to be an entrepreneur at the time? Yeah, yeah, we got the project, we started the company, uh, we invested a whole uh, 500 shekels in, uh, in the company. That was the whole, all the money that uh, Shonut raised uh, in its lifetime. Uh, again, we were, uh, there was one, uh, talking 92, the industry, the VC industry was not existing in Israel uh, back then. The industry started in 93, 94 with the uh, government use MAF fund. So started uh, Shanut. Um, you said that there wasn't any VC in There was Israel. one VC, one, one Israeli VC, a $10 million fund. Uh, they heard about us, they came to us, they, I think they got, they offered, Seventy thousand thousand dollars for eighty percent of the company. We said no, um, and that, that was uh, fair. yeah, yeah. That's uh, that was uh, very fair. Um, and then we basically started the company bootstrapping. So the first company was Shanut bootstrapped. Uh, we we were profitable from the very few uh, months. Uh, what we did. The, what was the project? We implemented the mathematical algorithms to improve the recognition accuracy of voice and character recognition. So we worked with the largest companies in that space. Uh, OmniPage, it was one of the companies was called OmniPage, another one was called Booktout, uh, through a joint project that were funded by the Bird Foundation uh, that, uh, that supports joint collaboration between Israeli and, uh, and US companies. We did actually four projects supported by Bird, so that, and that was a major support for the company. I think Avi knows us from those days, uh, end of the 90s. Uh, and, um, um, and out of Shonut, so again, the first company was Shonut, we didn't raise any money, then we spun off two companies out of Shonut. One, is, one was focusing on industrial uh, uh, software, we sold that about a year and a half later. Well, it's uh, what you want, though. I mean, there was no plan. There was basically projects uh, that came. Uh, I mean, the main know-how was all around mathematical algorithms, specific type of algorithms of, of uh, uh, probabilistic algorithms. It was, I mean, the name was Shanut Probabilistic Solutions. I mean, that uh, horrible name for a company. Uh, and um, so that was the core. So, and we implemented those algorithms, one in, in voice and character recognition, the, uh, that we implemented those similar type of algorithms in, uh, uh, in optimization of uh, industrial uh, planning in specific domains of industries. Uh, I'm one of the world experts in uh, 
manufacturing of concrete pre-stressed planks and you don't know I you don't know about that and you don't want to know about that um, so we and we spun off some of those as, as companies and then actually that company specifically we sold to one of the two to the partner that we had uh, so n until 97 that was Chanute and then uh, out of Chanute we spun off Onset uh, and that's a company that uh, that sold to 1600 Ent Enterprises. Onset raised a lot of money over the, over the years oh, from 97 it. from 97 to 2006. Um, I was the, the chairman, the CEO, uh, the founder. We sold uh, enterprise mobility uh, solutions. So we sold basically it was the very early days of mobile in the enterprise. I mean mobile in the enterprise all the way until 2005 was basically BlackBerry. So you talked about enterprise and mobile workers, you, uh, you talked about BlackBerry. It was not even called smartphones or mobile devices. It was basically pager-like devices. Uh, it looks like pager with a small keyboard. Um, and we were the first company that developed solutions for that, uh, for that platform. Wow. And that's how we started to work very, very closely with them and, and joined, the board, joined the advisory board and worked uh, very closely so what, with them. what did you develop? We developed a, a solution that, uh, I mean, we came to them with an idea we, which was basically taking the same technologies that, uh, that we had for converting, for co voice and character recognition and converting those messages from static voice files or, or image files like fax to textual messages that sit in the mailbox as text messages. So think about a small page or a wireless device and you got your emails delivered. But uh, if you got a fax or if you got a voicemail, you got a note, a notification that you have a voicemail or a fax, but you couldn't do anything with this. So we actually plugged into the messaging systems of the organization and converted messages from one media to another media so that the fax became textual message that can actually be read and the wow. voice. voice uh, yeah, it was a good idea. So they did were, you yeah. approach them? We approached them. We, we approached them. We had this, uh, this solution within the space of, then it was called Unified Messaging. And then we worked with all the big guys and we approached them and basically said, if we work together, your customers will now be able to see not just the emails, but, e but voicemail and fax. They said, uh, great idea, but not too interesting. What's interesting is actually, at the early days, they couldn't actually read the attachments of the emails. So you got the email, but if there was an attachment to the email, the attachment wouldn't open. You just know that there is an attachment. Uh, we met them Thursday afternoon in New York. Uh, Friday afternoon, they had a demo uh, that they can basically forward the message to a mailbox that we had. We chunked uh, the message and we turned the text of the attachment to, uh, uh, to the device. Within, um, within, hang on, within two days? No, 24 hours. Uh, it was, I mean, it was very quick. We had every, I mean, first of all, it's not rocket science. Uh, it was much, much easier than, uh, than character and voice recognition. But the, the nice thing is that we had all the infrastructure of the server that uh, was doing much more sophisticated, much more CPU intensive things of converting fax and voice and converting attachment was really, really easy. So we gave them a demo and that was really a, a killer uh, uh, companion product to their installations because any time they sold BlackBerry Enterprise Server to enterprises and they sold, they were the only game in town until 2005 basically. So the attachment was a major issue uh, and we sold to many organizations uh, at that time. So you, did you sell your product to BlackBerry? Or did no. You no, we, uh, we decided not to sell the, Black, the, the product to BlackBerry. It was very clear from the very beginning uh, and actually someone asked me about uh, when, when we talked about uh, uh, about kind of a switching or when, when you, the world collapses around you. So it was very clear to us when we started the attachment, uh, when we entered what was called meta message, which is uh, uh, that conversion of attachment of, of the email, that we have a very short window until this becomes part of their solution. So uh, it's, it's a feature that needs to be, had to be part of the BlackBerry platform. And it was clear that, yeah, we, we might have a nice ride. I mean, my estimate there back then was that it will take 12 months until they actually implement something. Whether they buy that from us or buy that from another company or build it internally, it's, again, not, big, not a big deal. Um, I was actually wrong. I think we, uh, I mean, eventually we had three years of, uh, of until they came out with a solution. But it was very clear from the very beginning that we are bridging a gap that they need to close. It's, uh, it's not a business that... Uh, so if we sold that through them, it wouldn't give us a way to create direct contact with the customers. Uh, so it was important for us from the very early days to have 
direct contact, that's what, that's what I touched with you, but direct contact with the customers. Um, and within those three years, I established three customer advisory boards of the top customers that knew us, that liked us. So we had one in the government, so that was the Senate, the House of Representatives, Social Security, uh, Capitol Police, uh, uh, two more. Uh, we had a customer advisory board in the financial uh, market and we had customer advisory board of the top legal firms. We had at that, at that point 50% of the top 100 legal firms uh, of the US as customers. And with them over those two, uh, two or three years we defined vertical solutions that, uh, that we could so sell later when the horizontal kind of gap product went away. We which it did uh, around 2003, 2004. But by then we had that relationship with the customers and we had solutions for the customers that w already were defined with them. So, it's, uh, wow. uh, so that's why we didn't sell through BlackBerry. If, if we started to sell through BlackBerry, it would have been probably easier in terms of sales, in terms of investment in the, in the sales organization. But less then revenue. when they replaced us, maybe less revenues, but uh, m definitely less revenue per sales, but maybe more revenues in terms of distribution. But once they decided to, uh, if they, dis or when they decided to end to put that as part of the problem, we would be lost, kind of left with nothing, no connection with the customers because it's basically their customers. So that's, that's we very specifically decided in 2000 not to go this way. I'm now sitting next to the pioneer of mobile applications. No, BlackBerry is the pioneer of mobile applications. Uh, you, I was, you, uh, I you was part of. Uh, oh my yeah. gosh! It's. Uh, <laughs> it was. Uh, it was. Yeah. It was called programming. It wasn't called mobile <laughs> applications back then. <laughs> application. Yeah. It's. Uh, this is it was. Uh, it was an interesting. Uh, wow. yeah. And you, you and you mentioned that you knew that this is. You estimated this would take about a year until they developed this. And then you're kind of through with business. You wouldn't have any business. Yes. And, and you decided anyway that you would do this. Yes, because we thought that this is a ma an amazing seeding mechanism of the market. So that we, that's a way for us. I mean, first of all, we made a lot of money selling that, those solutions at that time. Uh, but we, we thought that that's because we had basically something in our hand that was very easy to get customers to buy and to create a contact uh, uh, with the customers. And, and, uh, and we very specifically said that we will use that in, as, as a way to create a, a customer base for us that we will be able to sell later on solutions. Uh, we actually, the first solution was in the legal uh, vertical. We launched that first. We turned out that uh, law, law firms and uh, lawyers in general are much better in getting your money than paying you money. <laughs> so that was not too successful. Um, the second one was in the government space, and that was very successful. Uh, we have uh, I have patents on this. It's uh, it's basically we uh, created a system that allows, in emergency, when the backend systems uh, collapse, uh, if uh, the Pentagon becomes a quadragon, uh, like it happened uh, on uh, September 11, then uh, and the backend systems uh, collapse, then. Uh, uh, allows emergency communication based on, uh, based on the mobile devices. And these st systems are still uh, the basis of the communication on Capitol Hill between the Senate, the House, and Capitol Police. Uh, so when was it that you were part of the U.S. Senate Committee? We sold the system to the Senate, the House, and Capitol Police on 2004, 5, and 6. Uh, at the end of 2006, the Senate established a committee that defined the next generation of the public warning alert system. Our systems were used within those organizations for internal use, but uh, the, the Americans, as, as they always do, did a very uh, nice uh, kind of structured process of defining the next generation. I mean, the public alert systems until then were based on radio and TV. Uh, they said, okay, there's all this digital and mobile thing going on. How can we extend that to, uh, uh, to uh, the, the alerts to, to those devices? And they picked about 30, I think we were, uh, different uh, ex uh, experts from the different domains to, to define that uh, system. Actually, one of the leading companies that, uh, that develop systems based on those recommendations is an Israeli company really? uh, yeah, called the Vigilo uh, that we, as our crowd, invested in. So uh, it's all kind <laughs> of, uh, uh, wow. it's, yeah. You're closing a circle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, was, uh, I was a very uh, uh, strong supporter of a Vigilo, as Prescott <laughs> can uh, attest, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so how did September 11 pass? I mean, with all the decisions that you took, did you manage to? Actually, the September 11 was the big. I mean, 
Uh, we met a few months later, uh, after September 11, we met uh, the, actually the Financial Customer Advisory Board, and Lehman Brothers was there, rest in peace, uh, uh, Citigroup, uh, some top financial customers in New York, and uh, one of them said, one of them was actually in the building uh, and managed oh. to go down, and he said that everyone will remember, I, I remember the sentence, everyone will remember that on September 11, BlackBerry pin-to-pin -pin was the only thing that worked. I mean, BlackBerry oh. had this pin-to-pin -pin messaging. And that was the basis, that was in 2001 or the beginning of 2002, that was the basis, that specific remark was the basis for our patents and our systems for the emergency communication. Oh, so uh, really, really got uh, nice feedback out of the, out of the advisory boards. Beautiful. So um, what lessons did you learn? With, no, you know what, let me ask you something else. You told me that on onset, you know, you started, it was your baby, obviously. You were there for how many years? Onset uh, from 97 to 2006, so uh, wow. nine years. And you told me in the preliminary interview that you started out with, you know, VCs and everything. You raised a lot of money, and then it kind of clashed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so... Uh, yeah. I had more small ones in the middle, but uh, basically the three phases. There's Chanute, that's the first one until 97, then 97 to 2006 was Onset. Chanute did not raise money, Onset raised close to 25 million over the years. Did you structure uh, that as like a, a father and No, 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 there was no connection. I mean, uh, Onset was a spin-off of Chanute, but completely different, uh, different structure, and Chanute uh, licensed technologies to Onset, to Onset and faded uh, afterwards. So I mean, we sold part of it. No, but the patents were all done by, by Onset at that, par at that part. Uh, so Onset raised a lot of money. Onset went through many cycles of funding uh, from the years 97 and 2006. And uh, I mean, everyone says that 2008 was a tough time. It's nothing relatively to 2002. 2002 was horrible. Uh, w was a horrible year for fundraising, so Onset raised uh, money then too. So I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of fundraising. Uh, uh, and in 2007, when I decided to leave, uh, leave, leave Onset, I recruited a new CEO. I asked uh, Yair Shamir why, now. Why uh, did you decide to leave? Uh, at that point, I mean, you know, at some point you need to think. Um, I said to my board, I said to the chairman that they replaced me, Ayir Shamir, uh, I asked him to become the, a board member at, at some point, and then, uh, and then he became, uh, he replaced me as a chairman. And I said that basically if I look at that, and, uh, uh, as a startup or as a CEO or as a founder, you basically need to look at three components. And you don't necessarily need to have three of those, but uh, one is financial, uh, and actually that's usually not one, that's usually the third in your, uh, in your criteria. Uh, I think you, uh, realistically, people don't jump into this just for the money or primarily for the money. Uh, the second is uh, responsibility. At some point, you have responsibility for the people, for the investors, for... Uh, and the third is th that you enjoy that. Um, and if I look through the years, then... 2002, for instance, was very tough year. What uh, I did not enjoy, definitely did not enjoy it. And uh, the responsibility was, I mean, you don't leave, if, it's, if you think there's a chance, you don't leave. Uh, I mean, there were 60 people working in the company, uh, going down to 40 at that point. But, uh, but I mean, it was tough, but uh, you don't leave. So responsibility was out of those kind of, you know, responsibility, enjoyment, and, uh, and financial. Uh, responsibility, I think, was the main focus of the of 2002. Um, you, you stayed in the company, although yes. you did not like it. And then in 2006, I kind of figured out that actually I have nothing uh, out of the three. So, uh, uh, I mean, responsibility, the company was doing well. The company was profitable and hitting the numbers for five quarters at, uh, when, at the quarter that I, le that I announced that I want to leave. Uh, so I thought that someone else can replace me and it will be fine. Uh, so that's the responsibility part. I thought that, uh, you know, it's time to, uh, I mean, I can go now and not, uh, I did not enjoy, I mean, there were some dynamics of, uh, again, uh, not so much the good, the good, but the bad and the ugly. Uh, <laughs> there were some uh, dynamics uh, on the board level, on the investor level that I did not like. Uh, and financially, I mean, if you go through all those rounds, I mean, uh, and you have, so I decided to leave and then uh, started Nobix uh, in 2007. 
which went back to the model of not raising money. So Nobex was profitable from the fourth month of, uh, wow. of, uh, of after we started that, so still like going. I'm not uh, raising money anymore. <laughs> I, can, I can state that even, uh, <laughs> even more extreme. And mo no investor is, is touching Nobex, even not with a stick of six oh meters. Oh my God. Okay, but now so you're a big thing. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, uh, <laughs> I dance with the devil. Um, so how, how did you, okay. We, we, we can uh, we can jump. Uh, we will we'll jump. We need to talk about no, but I, I must say, in the, at this point, you said I'm not raising money anymore. Yeah. But then you become a VC. How I'm not raising money to my company. That's yeah, not that's the thing. Yeah. Okay. So how uh, do you function as a VC after all the things that you have had to put up being at the entrepreneur side with the good, the bad, and the ugly of? So, so first of all, our crowd is the first fund that uh, John Medved, uh, the CEO and founder of our crowd, came to me. I think I was the first one to join. Uh, I think Prescott was pretty much the second, uh, <laughs> but, but from the very early days. So, uh, uh, you want to maybe in, tell them a little bit about our crowd, yeah, just in uh, case that they don't really know? So our crowd is a fund that we started uh, an equity crowdfunding site. So uh, we basically invest our own money. Uh, so every, every deal that we make, our own partners' money goes into the deal, but the majority of the money comes from angel investors, a network of angel investors. It's not an angel club. It's a network of 4,000 investors, uh, registered, accredited investors around, around the world. Uh, but it operates, the, the three flavors, flavors of equity crowdfunding platforms. Uh, there's the flavor of we are just a platform and we might do some checks on the validity of the project or the validity of the company, but we're basically a platform that allows investors and, uh, and uh, entrepreneurs to meet and maybe they're successful and we'll get some, some commission out of that. That's not what we are. There's another flavor which basically is uh, a flavor of a platform that allows top angels to top angels to syndicate the deal. So if Gigi Levy is uh, a mega angel or, or Guy Gamzo that was here last time, a mega angel in Israel, he can actually be on a platform. There's a platform that just started in Israel uh, that works in this, uh, in this way, I angels. And uh, uh, so top angels can basically say, I'm going to invest in this company and you can join me in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in investing in this company. Uh, they, they can join me? Pretty much everyone, I mean, it depends on the regulations. I mean, every, every country has its own regulation on who is an accredited, what is called accredited investors. I'm not going to dive into this, but it's not open under the current regulation. Uh, investments in equity are not open to all investors. You need to be basically, uh, you, you need to either have uh, a given amount of money uh, net worth or a given amount of, uh, of uh, annual income. And each country is uh, different numbers. Um, so, so that's the second one. That's basically when the angels are, are leading the round and people join the angels. And we operate in the mode of uh, VC-like fund. So we act, I mean, when an entrepreneur is coming to us, they see basically an organization that acts like a VC. We go through the whole process of negotiation, of uh, term sheet, uh, due diligence, just like a VC fund. We then decide that we want to invest ourselves in the, in the company, I mean, the, uh, our own partner's uh, money, and then we open that to other people to join us as a fund. So basically, the three models, one is completely non-curated, just a platform, and angels and, uh, and uh, I mean, investors and entrepreneurs uh, will meet. Second, uh, second model is that the angel is the one syndicating, and third is that, uh, that the fund leads, and we are in that, uh, in that space. We started that. Uh, February last year officially. We did uh, so far 37 deals wow. in Israel, so we are the most active uh, fund in Israel. Um, we, we invested... Is it just February last year, uh, so a little over a year. We were doing roughly a deal a week uh, in, uh, in 2014. Just in Israel? In 2013, 90% of the deals were in Israel. Uh, we did, uh, in 2013, th 32 deals, out of which three deals were outside of Israel and the rest are in Israel. Um, 2014, the target is that a third of the deals will be outside of Israel and, uh, and, I mean, basically to double the number of deals from uh, last year and to do a third of them outside, and I'm responsible for the international expansion uh, of the deal flow and, uh, and the investor base beyond, uh, I mean, the investor base in, in 
most, mo most of our investors are US based, so investor base is international, but the whole deal flow and how to get more investors uh, uh, globally is, uh, is a major focus in 2014. So if I get it right, um, you mentioned that all the angel investors, they, are, they choose which startup they want to invest. It's not like uh, vague or they just put their money and it's a bit. They choose exactly which startup they want to join. Ex exactly. I mean, the, the model is basically a hybrid between VC and angel investment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we basically say to the investors who, who are our customers that, uh, that they have the benefits of both models. I mean, if potentially a very large investor wanted to put a seven digit di uh, check into a VC fund, he could, do, he could do that. I mean, first of all, it's not open to small investors. No VC will get, take 50K or 100K from investors, but he can potentially put a large check in the VC and then gets the benefits is that he gets good deal flow because the VCs are connected to the, to the deal flow. Uh, I mean, relatively to what he can do as an angel, say from the US investing in Israeli startups, how can he find uh, the good companies? So he ties to a good deal flow, he ties to a good uh, professional process of due diligence, of negotiation. He gets the rights. I mean, we are investing in Series A. I mean, our rounds are between half a million to three and a half million dollars. So it's not seed money. He gets, so he gets the rights of a, C, of, uh, of, uh, of a VC, uh, preferred shares. I mean, everything that uh, coming from, again, the 25 million of the good demanded ugly, I think our term sheet is relatively uh, nice to the entrepreneur, but it's still preferred shares. It's not common shares, it's a, it's a VC type of investment. Um, How many angels do, uh, in average, are part of a deal? The angels are on average put in each one of the deal $31,000. I mean, the minimum that they, they can put is 10,000. The average of the investors, the investment they've made so far is 30 some thousand dollars, uh, which means that in the average investment that we did is a little over a million. Uh, so we raised a little uh, close to $40 million, uh, a little over 40 million by now uh, to the startups. Uh, so on average, about 30, 35 angels are coming into a deal. But to the startup, they see one investor. Yes. So we create a partnership of all the investors that came into that deal. So let's say someone put 100,000, someone put 10,000, someone put 50. We create a partnership. We are also part of the partnership because $50,000 at the minimum come from our money. And then we, the, the, the startup sees one entity, one line in the cap table that is that entity. And we, or a mentor on our behalf, we present all the organ all that partnership in the board if we have a board seat or, or, or uh, as an investor. So that means also that if I get an investment from our crowd, there are quite an amount of angels that believe in my project. Yes, I mean, and, and that in general a major, I mean, when you look at crowdfunding, not just equity, when you look at uh, crowdfunding and Kickstarter and Indiegogo and uh, uh, part of the whole a part of the success in raising money on crowdfunding is basically that you got buy-in from either investors like our case or the market. Uh, if you are successful in, in uh, your, your project is successful on Kickstarter, for instance, you there know. were quite a lot of people that liked your idea and, and kind of basically pre-ordered uh, your product. Um, and I think that in general you would see, uh, you start to see, but you'll see more of that, a new, a new uh, uh, process of raising money. Uh, so we, uh, I mean, originally or traditionally you had, uh, you know, uh, you started the startup, a few, you did a few months without, uh, without eating, without revenues, uh, then you raised a little money from uh, friends and family or your own money, and then you got to some angel and he got a small seed investment, and then you got to a VC, hopefully you got to a VC, and you got uh, Series A, and then you got Series B, and then you got Series C, and then, uh, and then maybe someone bought you or you went public. So that was, uh, that, that's the traditional route. I think you're seeing more and more a route that maybe at the end we'll get to the VC, but the first steps will actually be step that if you have a consumer product, you might try Head Start or Kickstarter or Indiegogo. I mean, uh, uh, basically pre-selling your product as a, as a proof of concept and to, as a way to get money that is not dilutive. Then you potentially can go to iAngels or AngelList or, and have, I mean, that angel now might not just be a single angel, but he, you can actually use him to syndicate a large round and then you'll go to the equity crowdfunding guys that will write checks of a few million dollars and all this still without getting VC money in 
And the benefit of not getting VC money in, I mean, you might want get VC money in after that, but the benefit of not getting VC money in until that stage is that the VCs know that, the VCs say that, but in many cases, VCs still invest in company. I mean, every, when a VC invests in company, he know or he believes that the company will shoot for the stars, will get to 200 million, 100 million revenues, will be a major way, ma major ways, major success. Uh, 90% of the companies, even the successful ones, do not get there. They can be a nice business that does $10 million with $3 million profit, uh, very sexy technology, customers like them. I mean, I'm talking from experience on, on Onset, for instance. This situation is not a situation that the VC can live with. It doesn't fit the, biz the VC business model. The VC needs an exit. He needs to, within seven years, to get rid of, of his holding and sell that. Dividends of paying on profit, that's not something that, that the, v the VC likes. It can be an amazing... I mean, first of all, it can be what can be done. So, you know, with onset, I got to that roughly that level, a little more than that. And then I, I thought that it can grow over time, 50% a year. But that's not, I mean, that, that was the space we were at. That, was, that doesn't fit the business model of a, of a VC. If you go uh, somewhat, uh, it's al always the personality issue, uh, but uh, uh, that scenario, if you get to that scenario of realizing that uh, you're not going to be a, a billion dollar company, but you are going to be a successful company, if you get to that point with only angel money or no money, uh, so private money, all the scenarios are open, and the scenario of being profitable and uh, uh, and collect, I mean, p giving dividends is an amazing scenario for the entrepreneur. Quality of life is, and I would even argue financially, uh, that that is at least uh, as good as uh, as a VC route in terms of dilution, in terms of quality of life. This scenario is, you get one dollar from a VC too early and you get stuck in that scenario of not being a big company, uh, you and the VC don't see eye to eye in what needs to you happen with the company. You might get shut down instead of just being profitable and successful. I, yes, I mean, that, that happens too, yeah. You mentioned, okay, you mentioned that you got from Andy Grove uh, the best advice as a, yes. a CEO of the company, could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So, so that uh, that uh, definitely falls under the good, uh, in the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, Intel Capital uh, was one of the investors. Uh, was actually, I think, my best investor at Onset. Uh, they invested two million dollars in Onset uh, in two thousand, and uh, uh, Intel Capital is and was very active uh, corporate investor. At that point, they had three hundred enterprises that they invested, uh, three hundred uh, startups that they uh, invested in. And uh, every summer, uh, they got the CEOs of the startups uh, of, the, of the portfolio to uh, a CEO summit, which was basically our uh, annual kaitana of uh, <laughs> three days. Amazing, uh, amazing three days. I mean, the food was uh, unbelievable. The resorts were great. And uh, <laughs> but uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, and hey. and. Um, and the program w was unbelievable. And Andy Grove was uh, the chairman of Intel at that time. Andy Grove was one of the three founders of, uh, of Intel. And he was always giving both uh, a talk to everyone, as well as uh, sometimes one-to-one, -one, sometimes small, uh, small groups of people kind of uh, discussions. And in one of those, we were maybe three or four people uh, speaking with him. And he's, uh, I mean, you need to envision him. He's like, he was 75 or so at that point very fit, I mean, uh, always leather jackets and, uh, and mentality of an house. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, he had no political correctness. He said whatever he wanted to say. I mean, he had no, I mean, he didn't give, uh, you know, just a... Uh, wasn't softening uh, 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 No, it was just... Um, and one of the discussions, and I remember the Enron thing came up, he was on the stage in front of 300 CEOs, were just, I mean, he just went uh, ballistic on that. Uh, but in that specific session, what we discussed, and I asked him, um, and y you probably all kind of uh, feel that, what I hated the most is, uh, uh, you know, uh, an investor would come, or a VC would come, or someone, uh, someone would come, and would hear what I do, and three minutes into this, uh, say, I'll tell you what you need to do. Uh, how, ma how, much, how many times that happened to you? I mean, like, 
what the fuck? I mean, you know, three minutes about my business, okay? I'm doing this for seven years, okay? And in three minutes, uh, based on the smile, I see that you kind of uh, relate to this, right? I mean, how, why do you think uh, you might be the smartest guy on earth, but there's no way that in three minutes, you know, on my space, be better than what I know from the trenches over six, seven years, to the point that you said, tell me, I'll tell you what. Uh... Now, the point is that in some cases, I mean, if you are an entrepreneur by default or by nature, uh, you have charisma. I mean, uh, you manage to persuade uh, your friends to work with you, yourself to do something that is completely irrational and uh, not take salary for a few months and, uh, and work 18 hours. Uh, you manage potentially to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, persuade investors to invest in you and put their own money. And this works the worst on you. I mean, you know how to sell stories to yourself. Uh, and in many times, people from outside come and they do have an insight. And the insight is not necessarily because they know about your business better than you, but because they've seen similar things. And I mean, many times when someone present, almost all, every, every time that someone present to me a startup, I'm trying to find the equivalent in different, in different industries. I mean, this, oh, he wants to be this for this segment. Uh, so ways for, I mean, I hate when someone say, I want to be ways for something because that's like uh, aluf batslut, aluf shum. Uh, that's, you know, it's a, uh, but, uh, but, but that, so when, when you sometimes speak with people with, that saw things, they can give you that, but because you persuaded yourself and because of, uh, realistically, you're not open to getting, uh, to getting this, uh, this advice. I mean, you, uh, uh, in many times you reject that because uh, it's, it's, it's not what you thought or, or and, and again, and I, I remember that on myself. And we discussed that with Andy Grove and then he said, uh, he told me, uh, let me tell you a story. And um, I think we'll finish with this, but uh, uh, Intel started not with chips. Intel started with memory, uh, uh, memory chips. And they started and they got to about $100 million in sale, which was for, for a US hardware company. That's not a lot, but it was uh, starting to be a business. And then the Japanese came into this market and basically killed them. I mean, the, you know, just killed the uh, Intel competition in terms of quality, in terms of prices. and. Uh, and they said the three founders of Intel, uh, Andy Gove, Bob Noyce, and uh, Gordon Moore, Go the Moore law of CPU dupl uh, uh, duplicating itself every 18 months, and uh, Bob Noyce was the chairman and one of the founders, and Andy Gove. Um, they sat in the, in the office of Bob Noyce and basically bitching about the situation. You know, everything is bad, blah, blah, blah. The investors will kick us out very soon, or we need to close, or we need to, uh, to close doors. Um, and then Andy Grove asks, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Bob Noyce asks, uh, so, okay, let's say they throw us out and they bring a new CEO in. Uh, what does he do? And Gordon Moore said, I don't know, but not, mo not memory chips. Um, <laughs> so Bob Noyce says, okay, so come with me. And they take the other two and they all, the three of them leave the, the building and go to the parking lot. And then they say, okay, now turn around and we enter in the building and we are the new CEO. And we're trying to figure out what he would do instead of us if, uh, if a new CEO is in place. And it sounds cheesy, but that's, that's how I kind of got over that uh, getting stuck in the same uh, direction and the same uh, 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 conventions that you had for yourself. I mean, if you ask once in a while, okay, if someone else was managing the company instead of me now, what he would do, uh, then first of all, you cannot get angry at your thoughts because you invented the person. I mean, no one actually told you this is what you need to do. You are doing that exercise yourself, so there's no one to be mad at. Uh, and and it's, in many cases, it's very clear that some of your assumptions are just completely incorrect. Just uh, that you can't really sell this story anymore. I'll give you an example. I mean, at Nobex, for instance, Nobex is still alive, kicking, very profitable. Uh, we have a, it's a mobile application for radio. We have 15 million users. We have uh, uh, close to a thousand stations on platform. I mean, it's a, it's a very nice business. Uh, and when we started very 
naturally we started on, on Blackberry. Blackberry is the, uh, kind of the home turf. Uh, I knew also that there would be a lot of marketing that Blackberry would put behind us on the platform, which they did. And, uh, uh, so it was a very good decision to start with BlackBerry. But I sold myself a story for quite a long time that uh, we don't need to be on iPhone. That iPhone is crowded and, uh, and there's no, I mean, and it doesn't matter if we'll be at, uh, at the end of uh, kind of the tail on the App Store and there's no way to get visibility on iPhone. Uh, so we're better off focusing on BlackBerry and kind of being the number one on BlackBerry. Uh, and that's a, I, was ma I managed to sell my, the story that to me quite a lot of, I mean, for quite a few months uh, until I did that uh, thing of, okay, if there's a new CEO now, uh, and you there's can't no do, way. there's no uh, way that the new CEO would decide not to be an iPhone. So, and, then, and then the question is, okay, so what do you do with this? And then you need to define how to actually get customers, and, and which we did. Um, but that's an, that's an advice that I, I, and I remember, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I remember a few times during the years that that exercise was kind of got me out of being stuck, being too stubborn basically with, uh, with what I did so far. Oh, that's a good advice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that we need to address the questions that... Yeah, well, one question, please. The first one, please. Okay, Israel is a startup nation. I believe our strongest point is helping each other. So how can you help young entrepreneurs? Advise maybe, uh, meeting to guide, I mean, first of all, I, I must say one thing, okay? And, uh, uh, Israeli startup nation, and you can talk about why. I'm not sure that uh, helping each other is, uh, is the, the number one uh, feature uh, in Israel. Uh, and so, so I'm not sure of the assumption uh, that leads to the question. I mean, uh, 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 I think that there are other things. I think that uh, the fact that we get at the age of 18 to the army and get to work uh, on interesting and important things with, we don't say that, but basically with no budget limits. I mean, uh, we do have all the equipment that we need if the project is, uh, is important. And the most important thing is that no one tells us how to do this. I mean, it's, uh, it's not that you get into an organization that basically says, this is how we are doing things and this is how a project is run. You, at the age of 18, get to basically work on really important stuff and say, you know, you just need to do this and uh, find a way to do this without indoctrination. So I think this is the main, uh, the main thing. In our crowd, specifically to that question, um, a major part of the, of the model, we're not there yet in terms of implementation, we'll get there, I think, at the second year, it's the second half of 2014, is what we call crowd building. So we think that not only we can get crowdfunding to the to to uh, the, the startup, but we can again, as you said, I mean, it's not only the investors that invested in you; it's the whole network that knows about you. And if we find and we think we have a way to harness the the capability of the network and basically help the company in its business in the 50 some countries that we have investors in. That's a major, major, major uh, plus to the, so that's how we, we, we focus. We're very engaged in, uh, in the community in Israel, so uh, in the startup community, so we do this, I mean, kind of meeting and, uh, and mentoring, and, uh, uh, but I think that the main part would be to really systematically build into the platform a way to help, uh, to help our startups. Thank you.